Hello, my name is Linda James and I am an assistant professor of art history at the University of Wisconsin Platteville. And today we are in the Laura and Harry Knorr Gallery, the University Art Gallery. And we're in an exhibition that I organized and curated called Find Art, Selections from the Permanent Art Collection of the University of Wisconsin Platteville. The title, Find Art, is a nod to an accidental discovery that I made in 2009 of a wonderful print by the modernist James Enzor. The print is dated 1888. It's titled Murder, which of course is very provocative as Enzor's work was and is. And it started a real avalanche, if you will, of discovery. To make a long story short, this exhibition is a nod to finding art that had been lost, in some cases for decades, to institutional memory. And it has been revived in this form through a collaboration of students, many of them art history students, but not all, faculty and staff, and also alumni. Stu these people, these collaborators, researched and wrote about this show, and this is a nod, indeed, to looking at art in a very large way. Not only writing about it, researching about it, not only looking at it in the wall, but also looking at it through the books that are on view here, and the DVDs and videotapes as well. The first piece I'd like to talk about is this powerful print by the French modernist Georges Rouault. Rouault's life covered the last part of the 19th century and a good portion of the 20th. And he's known for his powerful religious statements, but even more than that, his critique of those who have power and his identification with those who do not. And he is particularly angry in many respects at those who abuse the power that they have. And he empathizes with the victims, the disenfranchised, and the marginalized. We're looking at a print here from one of his most famous series called the Miserere series, Have Mercy series. And the title of this piece is This Will Be the Last Time, Father. It comes from a series that Wu did after World War I, and it is generally understood as one of his most powerful critiques of that horrific time. For me, quintessentially, the work has the line work of Wu, the darkness which is full of pathos. I don't think nihilism, but pathos. And the most important um, element that I'd like to talk about is Wuo's use of the priest, the skeleton figure of death, and the man-child in the middle that plays very much on the title, This Will Be the Last Time, Father. The man is small in scale in the middle, he seems both like a child in his kneeling position and size, but also in the way he touches uh, and is in a supplicant position in relationship to the large and heavy priest who is clearly burdened by many fears and ailments of the world. So in a sense, the last time shows that this man is in his last confession but the longer you look at the image, you have to ask perhaps that there is a, another interpretation, or rather, is there another interpretation? 
If you look at the figure of death, the figure looks something like a parent ushering a child. The posture is not so fearful as so many images of death are, but rather if you look at the arms and the posture of the knee and thigh, it's as if the figure of death is pushing the man towards the priest. And in a sense, another interesting read is that the man is saying uh, to father death, this will be his last confession. I think Rouault leaves us with a fabulous image of uh, the questions in many respects. This piece is by Robert Arneson. Where Rouault criticized power in the 1920s, Arneson is criticizing power in the 1980s. This is his print, The Colonel is at it again. It is death-like, monstrous, an alien form. And here Arneson has created a general, and there are fantastic symbols embedded within the uniform of this warmonger. Embedded in his cap is the symbol of the atom. On various buttons and in his epaulets are death uh, images. And here Arneson creates in a chaotic uh, and uh, powerfully gestural method an image of nuclear war and clearly his criticism of nuclear armament, the Cold War, and certainly what was going on in the 1980s. On a very different note, this piece by Christo and Jean-Claude shows delight, very different sense of not criticism of power, and yet, interestingly, it is. By that I mean that Christo and Jean-Claude, uh, artists uh, who come from Europe, Christo comes from Romania, um, powerful background in Eastern European, um, uh, in an Eastern European country and method of government. And uh, Jean-Claude comes originally from Morocco, another different kind of regime, very different than the Western democracy of America where they ultimately end up becoming citizens. The history of this piece is that um, Charles Schultz, the author of, the, of Peanuts, uh, put in a comic strip that Christo and Jean-Claude, who were famous for wrapping things, whether it be a bridge in Paris or islands uh, in Florida, had accidentally, or perhaps intentionally, wrapped the um, doghouse of Snoopy. Christo and Jean-Claude took up the comic strip challenge, in a way, and ended up wrapping a Snoopy doghouse. And they created not only a wonderful actual wrapped piece that was only uh, temporary in nature, but they created a series of drawings and prints from it as well that are a little more permanent. The signature aspects of Christian Jean-Claude, whether it be the gates in uh, Central Park or running fence in California, is the use of fabric. Fabric that hides and reveals fabric that transforms our vision of things. They wrap and then they unwrap. Time, too, is a key element because most of their work is done on a temporary basis, and yet powerful and extraordinary amounts of money and effort are made, um, or rather employed, to make this work. Above all, however, it is the process that interests me in relationship to these artists. First of all, a husband and wife, a, two, a man and a uh, woman artist work together collaboratively. But they also work with communities and they argue that their process is a process of democracy. Uh, very, very different than the idea of the artist in the garret, the artist idea, uh, the idea, excuse me, of an artist alone in a studio. And so where we have Woe and we have Arneson critiquing power, here we have Christo and Jean-Claude critiquing things other than democracy, 
and using their processes of making to lay out what indeed is democracy in art making. The next piece I'd like to talk about is by Marc Chagall, Captain Braxis's Dream. It's part of his Daphne and Chloe series that he did in the early 1960s. Chagall, of course, is known for his work that combines the mystical, the mythological, and the fairy tale. And this work is no exception. Instead of my talking about it, however, I'd like to read an account that a student wrote. This account is part of the exhibition itself because many of our students, art students, alumni, and faculty and staff did research and writing for this exhibition. So let me go ahead now and read this account. The picture is a depiction of a dream Captain Braxis had of Pan telling him to return Chloe, whom he had captured to her people. The use of vague outlines and varying shades of gray helped to portray the dream aspect. The ship's crew and landscape are for the most part monochromatic. The water, landscape, and minor characters are implied by a few sweeping lines, thus giving the impression of location and witnesses, but they're unfocused as they would be in a dream. The use of blue for the water and landscape also implies that it is night, with the world taking on blue tones in the moonlight. The main characters, on the other hand, are much clearer and in color. Pan, the god who sent the dream, is a dominating figure, drawing your eye and emphasizing his importance by being the brightest figure in the picture. Here he looks almost like the sun. He is a god, and the yellow is indicative of both his divinity and power. He is not to be crossed. The captain on the opposite side of the picture is in blue, a color associated with the sea. His posture and gesture are both of fear and acquiescence to the command of Pan. He is indicating that Chloe, the figure in the bottom center of the figure with the sheep, should leave him and follow Pan. It is also as though he is asking Pan not to smite him or his crew. Chloe is portrayed as both calling her sheep and submitting to the will of Pan, who is leading the way further ashore. It is interesting how you can sense the unrest in the picture, almost as if you were a part of the dream. The twisted figures and impressions of people and location lend it an eerie aspect that is slightly unsettling. It is easy to understand how Captain Braxis would have felt just doing your job and then offending the gods and having to make amends without losing face in front of your crew. This is a beautiful sculpture by Richard Hunt. Richard Hunt is one of the most important African-American artists of the latter half of the 20th century. And his art overall extends the tenets of modernism. And this sculpture indeed is in the spirit of such modernists as the Dada artist Jean Arp. But Hunt's work also represents a powerful sea change in our ideas about art, particularly art, race, identity, uh, and modernism itself. Because periodically, Hunt's work addresses the African American experience. And yet his dominant thrust, which is very clear in this piece here, is within an art that attempts to transcend the discourse of race, of multiculturalism, of politics and societal constructions. Indeed, for me, Richard Hunt navigates a fine line in his work. Indeed, his work walks quite a tightrope. This is a print by Robert Motherwell, another extraordinarily important artist, not only of modern art and of 20th century art, but in many respects of American art. He represents uh, the key art movement mid-century uh, that generates from the United States abstract expressionism. 
Key members of abstract expressionism also include artists such as Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning and Barnett Newman. Motherwell's piece is also important because it was used for a poster for the Chicago Art Expo in the early 1980s. The Expo itself marks another powerful change in the art world, particularly how we marketed the artwork. What is interesting to me is that in the 1980s, uh, our valuing of artwork, the economy around artwork began to become global in a way that was unprecedented. And so not only do we have a beautiful print by one of the most important abstract expressionists, but we have a print that was used to mark a new way of valuing and marketing art that continues to this day. The last piece I'd like to talk about is this print by Ellen Lanyon, done in the early 1980s. It is called Eagle Beak. It is a work by an artist who is a Chicago artist, but also a New York artist. I think for me, the most important element is that Lanyon, who was instrumental in the women's movement in art in the 1970s and 80s, has an art that approaches social justice issues from a different perspective than some of the other artists that I've shown you today. Her work deals with environmental issues. Her work deals with issues of ecology and nature. She is also an artist that combines elements of surrealism, elements of the Harry Hu and the Chicago Imagist, but also her own intimate interest. She is a, an extraordinary collector of things, not only visually, but in hand, and sometimes some very eccentric and strange things. Her work morphs things, and I think in that sense, she wants to morph us in the way we think about the world. The Alan Lanyon piece is the last work of this brief tour that I've taken you on today in the Laura and Harry Noor Gallery for this exhibition, Find Art. <clears throat> this exhibition is comprised of very diverse work. It is eclectic. And it also is made up of images by very important artists of the 19th and 20th century and the 21st century. Equally so, it's not only exhibition for an audience around modernism, but it's an exhibition that showcases an art catalog. This is the first publication of its kind on our campus. It is written by students. It is designed by our, art, uh, our graphic design professor, and it is really a collaborative effort, much like every other element of this exhibition. I hope that you will take the time to come down and see this wonderful exhibition, indeed, to find this art. <laughs>